So thanks for staying around to the end. I hope it's going to be worth it. Uh, so yeah, I want to talk about tools. And I also want to give you a little bit of an introduction to the compiler, specifically so that I can tell you about how you can use the compiler to make even better tools. So why do I want to do this? Well, I, I think tools are really important. They're, they're really important for any language's ecosystem because why do you use a new language? Well, you can use it because it's cool and it's fun and it's something that's new. But after a while, you get down to the essentials and you use a language because it makes you more productive. And how productive a language is, it's not just about the language itself and it's the, the libraries that it has and the ecosystems and so forth. It's the tools really help, okay? You can have the best language in the world, but if you have to compile it by hand, you're gonna be really slow writing it, okay? So good tools can make a, 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 a good language, super productive, lots of people will want to use it, and that's great. So Rust has some good tools at the moment, okay? Like things like Cargo, uh, debugger support, these are great. But I think there's like scope for making lots more tools and making some really good ones. And I think it's just a really interesting thing to hack on. And I think it's somewhere where you can have like a really big impact on a lot of people's lives by, by doing this work. So to start with, I want to give you a little bit of a, a demo of a few tools. Uh, this is kind of going to be fun. I have to switch uh, uh, to a different window. Okay, and a totally different resolution and, and so forth. So the first tool I want to demonstrate is Rust Format. So here's some code. It's perfectly good code, but it's kind of ugly. There's a few more new lines than you might like. Like this, uh, this is kind of confusing, having it all in one line. I can't read that very well. So um, let's run Rust Format. It runs. Hey, now it's beautiful. Okay. Like, I could have done that by hand, but it's kind of boring, and I probably would have missed a bit, and that's no fun at all. Whereas we have a tool that does it for you. It's fantastic. The next tool is uh, a lint. It's an extra lint. There are some lints in the compiler, um, but there are some, you can have extra lints. And a lint, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a check, like the checks the compiler does, but it's not essential for kind of the correctness of your program, the soundness of your language, but it might point out where you've done something that it might be right, but it's probably a mistake. Or maybe it's not a mistake, but you could have done it better. So the lint I'm gonna show you, it's part of the uh, Rust Clippy, which is like a big suite of lints. And this one, it's gonna look at this, this if statement. So this is kind of a typical beginner's mistake. You might see this like, you know, new programmers might do this a lot. It's not necessary, right? Like it's perfectly legal Rust code, but you don't really need it. And we've plugged in the lint, so I show you. That means we've plugged in the suite of lint. So when I build this, right, it's gonna tell me, I don't need that. I can just use the, the predicate. I don't need the whole if statement, okay? Ah, uh, that's not what I want. Oh dear. <laughs> um, I'm gonna apologize for this resolution. This is really, okay, that's, oh, too much. Okay, so final tool I wanna show you just now is a tool called DXR, and this is a tool for navigating your code, for searching your code, but we can do a much better job than you can with, say, grep or searching on GitHub or whatever. So, okay, I'm gonna just search for some string, let's, search for this, and it's just gonna find all the uses. Okay, not very impressive. I can do this on, with graph or something, right? But, you know, why don't I find all the implementations of a trait? Well, here are the three implementations, okay? Let's go for one of these. Let's find something interesting down here. Well, what's this search? Well, let's hover over and it'll tell me the type. Um, let's kind of jump to the definition of that and it's gonna find, yeah, the highlighting seems to be broken at the moment, I don't know why, but it's gone to the right place, right? Line 1048, there it's gonna show the field search, so I can just like jump to definitions like this. So hopefully this is something that's gonna make kind of understanding a new code base or a, code base, a large code base that you use with often much more, much easier. Okay, so hopefully you kind of whet your appetite a bit about tools, but I promised you an introduction to the compiler, and I'm gonna go and, and do that right now. And it's gonna be kind of high level. The, co the compiler's a big topic, I don't cover it much, so if you've already kind of hacked on the compiler, you're gonna find this very dull, and I apologize. 
So at the highest level, a compiler is just a bit of software which takes your source code and translates it to machine code. It's just code that can be executed on your machine. Of course, being Rust, most of the time it translates it into a whole bunch of borrow check errors, but <laughs> sometimes you'll get machine code. So the Rust compiler, and most compilers, at a very high level, we can break into these three phases. First of all is parsing and expansion. This is basically how you come from source code that you guys understand into uh, representation that the rest of the compiler can understand. Then we have the analysis phase where, and this is kind of like the, the bulk of the compiler, this analyzes the code, builds up a whole bunch of information about it, and checks it for errors and gives you any of these errors that, that happen. Then finally, code generation uh, uses the information we built up during analysis and generates that machine code that I was talking about earlier. I'm just going to drill down a bit into, into each of these phases, starting with parsing and expansion. So parsing, you, like I say, you start with the, the source code and then we gradually kind of like refine the information we have about that source code uh, with more and more kind of information until we end up with um, what's on the, your right side of the slide. Uh, we call it the abstract syntax tree, the, the AST. And this is a representation of the source code just in a tree format with create root at the top and every item is, well, every expression and sub-expression is a node in that tree. And information about each node is, is there, such as the name of the function, and then like we have children nodes for things like the arguments and so forth. And this is the representation that's used through the rest of the compiler um, to compile. Uh, so the expansion bit of parsing and expansion is about manipulating that AST that we got from your source code. So for example, if you've got these configuration attributes, then we can, you know, if, if you don't make the, the predicate in this CFG attribute, then we're just gonna lop off a whole subtree of the, the AST and ignore it forevermore, okay? If you've got macros in your code, then we're gonna take the, the bit of the, the AST, which is the, the use of a macro, and we're gonna expand that using the definition of the macro. Likewise with procedural macros or syntax extensions, whatever you wanna call them. And there's also some desugaring of language constructs where we translate kind of at the AST level from uh, some kind of higher level concepts into more primitive ones. So uh, for example, if let, we translate from uh, an AST node that looks like an, an if let expression into a match expression. And there's a few other places where we do that. Okay, analysis. The, like, analysis is where the compiler kind of gets uh, somewhat complicated, and so I'm gonna just kind of like highlight some of the, the more interesting parts of analysis. First of all is name resolution. So we have this, we've got this AST, but we've still just got like chunks of text. We, you remember we have the name of that function, but what does that really mean? Well, name resolution is about matching the uses of names with the declarations of names. So for example, like we use bar on the, the second line here, so we match that with where we first declared bar. And this gets a bit more complicated because we've got scopes and we've got use statements, import and so forth, but this is essentially all name resolution does. And this happens very early on in the analysis phase. After that, type checking uh, is another kind of important step in the analysis phase. And type checking is about checking that where you expect to get some type, you actually do in fact, you will in fact get a value of that type. So if you, if you write a function that takes a string, you're gonna actually only pass strings to that function. And type checking includes inference, and what that means is that for every expression, every sub-expression in Rust, we infer a, a type for that sub-expression, even when these have not been annotated, which we don't do in Rust very often, luckily. Uh, part of type checking is trait resolution. Uh, probably one of the more interesting parts of type checking, one of, and something that's quite unique to the Rust compiler versus a lot of other languages. Trait resolution essentially is about answering the question, if I have a method call, like I wanna call foo here, what's the, the actual concrete implementation of foo that gets called? 
And the reason this is different from name resolution, which I talked about earlier, is that this doesn't just depend on kind of like scopes and imports and stuff. This actually depends on the type of X, which we only know about during type checking, okay? So for example, if we know the, like the fully concrete type of X, then we might be able to just find exactly like a concrete implementation and we can just make a really simple static call to this implementation of foo right here. More interestingly, if we only have a bound on the type of X, so for example, we have a, a trait and you hopefully all remember, like a, a trait is just like an interface. It, it usually doesn't define any kind of implementation of any of these methods then at, at this time in the analysis phase in the compiler, then we can't actually decide what, uh, which implementation is gonna be used. Only the, the, the kind of more abstract declaration of the, the method. And so we kind of like remember this stuff and later on in the code generation phase, then we'll be able to work it out. Similarly, if you've got a trait object, you s again, you only know the trait and, and therefore only the kind of the, the abstract declaration of a method. And, but this time we're not gonna know it until runtime what we're gonna call. And so we just have to generate code, uh, a V table, which allows us to at runtime dynamically dispatch to the, to the right method. Okay, uh, the, the final chunk of analysis that I kinda want to call attention to is borrow checking. This is really important because it ensures memory safety in Rust, which is something we all care about, and is why you might be using Rust in the first place. It's also a really interesting, subtle bit of coding, which I have no time to explain. So we just have to continue, like, just believe it's magic, and you'll be pretty close to the truth, right? Okay, code generation, final phase of, of the compiler. Um, most of code generation is actually handled by LLVM. So as far as we're concerned, uh, Code generation, we can think of this like there's uh, a translation phase where we take the, the AST again and the information we acquired during analysis and we translate into um, a representation that LLVM wants, the LLVM IR. Uh, that's the LLVM dragon there. And then LLVM does all the rest of the hard work to, to churn out the noughts and ones that you can actually execute on your machine. And that's the compiler, right? So you all understand the compiler. I expect your PRs to start tomorrow. Like, with, Okay, so back to tools. And so I wanna kinda like maybe classify, kind of like define what I mean by kind of tooling. And I wanna really focus on what I kind of think of as productivity tools. And I mean that like in contrast to the essential build tools that you have to use to use Rust, uh, such as the compiler, the linker, your, basically your tool chain. So productivity tools, for example, the debugger, um, so you could work without the debugger, right? You, you have a bug and you can solve this just by staring intently at your code or hitting your head on the keyboard or like print statements, whatever. But a lot of the time using a debugger makes you much more efficient. You can solve your, your bugs much quicker. So it's a boost in productivity. Also the, the lints that I showed you earlier, this is another way to, to help debug your code. Another kind of tool, uh, tools that help you understand the code. So I showed you DXR, which helps you kind of navigate and search the code. Also in this category, visualizations. If you want to uh, visualize, say, the dependency graph of your program or the call graph, well, the tools can help you do that and help you understand the code. And another category, kind of automating kind of trivial or tedious tasks. So uh, the Rust format that I showed you or refactoring tools. Like these are all things that you can do yourself, but they're kind of boring and they take a long time and the machine can do them for you very quickly and usually just as well. So another way to kind of classify these tools is kind of how they're used or how they're implemented. So one thing you can do is you can extend the compiler. There are, there's a few ways you can extend the Rust compiler. Adding a lint is one way that I showed you earlier. Kind of more familiar for a lot of you will be adding a syntax extension to extend the language at the syntax level. Uh, you can also kind of plug in extra LLVM passes. So you can extend the, the compiler this way. At the limit, you can fork the compiler. You can write your own code that kind of deeply integrates with it and produce a new tool this way. 
Alternatively, you can make kind of a standalone tool. Uh, so it could be really standalone. So for example, if you want to just count the number of lines of code in, a, in your project, you don't need to talk to the compiler. You just like open all the files and count the number of lines, right? Or sometimes you want to ask the compiler for some more output. So for example, the, a debugger is going to uh, ask the compiler to generate debug info as well as the, the executable. DXR asks for a whole bunch of metadata from the compiler. And then these kind of tools can do some processing offline and then do their job, whatever that job is. Uh, also in this category, and probably kind of like the least well-known approach to, to implementing a tool is to kind of use parts of the compiler as a library. So we want information from the compiler. The compiler knows lots about your program, right? And so we want to extract that information without having to compute it ourselves because there's no point in duplicating all this kind of subtle and complex machinery in the compiler. And uh, I want to kind of demonstrate to you how easy this is, okay? And to do so, I'm going to demonstrate or walk through the implementation of another tool, which is for, for drawing a call graph. Uh, so it's gonna draw a call graph kind of like this. Uh, so this is the regex crate, and I'm gonna zoom in. And so each node in this graph is just a function or a method, and we draw a, an arrow for every function call from the caller to the callee. And the dotted arrows are virtual method calls where we don't know exactly what method is called at, um, while we're compiling, but we know at least one of these methods is gonna get called at runtime. So I, I hope that implementing this is gonna be surprisingly easy for you, okay? Like this, it turns out that implementing kind of quite a, a, a nice, kind of useful tool is actually quite easy. So just to show you how it's done, if I can remember the right keys. Okay, so. that. Okay, so, so at the very highest level, the way this tool works is we basically want to emulate what the compiler does. So we want to set up with all the kind of command line options and uh, environment variables the compiler would usually run with. So we're running in the same kind of environment. And then we want to do what the compiler does. We want to do the parsing and expansion of the analysis phase just like the compiler does. And then we want to stop and do our thing. Now you could like write all this code out, do it yourself, but you know, that would be a lot of work and you'd probably get it wrong. Luckily, the compiler lets us kind of uh, get it to do this stuff as a service for us. And there's a little bit of code called the, the driver, which coordinates kind of uh, setting up the environment for compilation and then running each phase of compilation in turn and sending the right data between each phase. And there's a few APIs you can use for interacting with this process. So at the highest level, We've got this, uh, so there's the driver, and we want to run the compiler. Um, does exactly what it says in the tin. And args are just the command line arguments, and this call graph calls is just the way that we interact at the, the top level with it. So the compiler has this trait compiler calls, which we're gonna implement, and actually, uh, like I say, we want to emulate the compiler. We want to do pretty much what the compiler does, and so we don't actually need to override most of the functionality that that trait already does for us. The only thing we're gonna do is override this builder method, which, uh, you can't quite see it, there it is, um, creates a compile controller, which give us, gives us more fine-grained over compilation. So, I'm just gonna show you here what we're gonna do. What did I say we want to do? We're going to run up until um, uh, the end of analysis, and then we want to stop. So this is how we tell the compiler that we want to stop at this stage. We don't need to carry on to code generation. And then we want to do our thing. And so we get an opportunity to do our thing here where we get to set a callback that gets called after analysis. And that callback, the driver is going to send us as much state about the compiler's internals as it possibly can at that stage. And what we're gonna do, so again, high level, what we want to do is we want to find every function that's defined like in the, the project that we're compiling, and every function call, and record some information about these things. Uh, and because of the methods, we're gonna need to do a little bit of post-processing, and then we're gonna just dump it out in a, in a format that GraphViz will understand. 
And the way we're going to find every single uh, function definition and every single function call is we're going to walk the AST that I talked about being the product of, of parsing. And whenever we find a function call or function, we're going to record it. So what this looks like, uh, this is us walking the AST here. I'm going to go into that in a second. Then we do our little bit of uh, post-processing. And then we dump out in a format the graph is can understand. So this is how we walk the, the AST. The, um, the lib syntax crate gives us a visitor trait that we can implement. And this is a classic visitor pattern which just walks down the AST and gives us an opportunity if we want at each node in the AST to do something. And if not, it just keeps on walking, which is exactly what we want. We want to walk the whole AST and just kind of stop on certain circumstances. So for example, if we get to an expression, then we might want to do something. And in fact, we want to check if it's a, a method call, and if it is, then we're going to record that. And I'll admit at this stage that you kind of need to know a little bit about what the, the AST looks like to know what you want to do here. But hopefully, like, understanding the AST is not, not too bad. You don't need to understand, like, how that AST, how, like, how source code is parsed to make that or how it's processed later in the compiler. Um, so once we know we're at a node, which is a method call, how do we get the information out of the compiler? Well, there's an API in the compiler called the Save Analysis API, and it's called that because you can do dash z save analysis to get all the information it knows, but we're not going to do that. Um, and we're going to say, give me all the data you have about this expression. So we pass the ST node to that, and then it gives us back a whole bunch of data. We expect a method call data because we know it's a method call. And we record that method call data for later. Um, I'm just going to show you what that looks like. Um, this, this data, you can look, these, these are just structs. It's not very interesting. You get kind of integer IDs, which you can cross-reference. You get strings for names and types and stuff. It's kind of, it's, it doesn't expose the compiler's internals, but it gives you hopefully kind of data that's relatively easy to work with. And we're just going to record it. We, we record all the static calls. We record all the dynamic calls. Uh, and the, the data tells us, perhaps not particularly, obviously, but you can work out which one's which. And then we do the post-processing, and then we kind of dump it out. And then GraphViz does its thing, and you end up with a call graph. Okay? So I don't expect you to follow that entirely, but hopefully it gives you an idea that it's not rocket science to do this. You don't need to understand too deeply the compiler's internals. And this is kind of a useful tool. You know, it's not like, it's not perfect. It's kind of a toy, but it's like something more three, four hundred lines of code. So I, if you want to know more, have a look through that. Um, I'll put my slides up for download so you can find the URLs for all this stuff. So, okay. Hopefully that's kind of got you a little bit excited about uh, tooling and the things that are possible to do in Rust and how we can make the world a better place with all these tools and you now want to get involved. So I kind of selected a few tools that are around. I'm sure they'd appreciate contributions. I'd encourage you to think of tools that would help you day to day and think about, um, you know, create new tools and come up with exciting things and this would be fantastic. And if you've got ideas, you want to more help, uh, more information about uh, how to to use these, the APIs I've talked about today, how to interact with the compiler in general or um, good projects to get involved with anything, please just ping me in whatever medium you prefer and hopefully I can help you out. And thanks for staying awake till the end of my talk. And that's all. Thanks.